Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Mastering Dungeons. I'm Sean Merwin here with a very special co-host this week, Michael Henderson, better known as Rel and creator of the Distal RPG. Michael, thank you for joining us this week. Yeah, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about you, uh, what you've been up to in the RPG world. Okay, so previously, uh, 2023, I left my seven-year video game industry career. I did a lot of really fun uh, work on a game called Planetside 2, and I got really burnt out, and I wanted to start making something of my own. I uh, find a creative uh, outlet, and I had been kind of toying with a an RPG side project. And then like many people, uh, you know, 2023... OGL hits and then many people kind of pull the trigger on wanting to make something new. And, uh, I was definitely one of those people who was kind of like flirting with the idea and, uh, mostly just as a fun game to play with my friends who are all, uh, very into dungeons and dragons fifth edition. Uh, long story short, time passes. I get a little bit more interested in it. Um, originally it was like a it was actually a side project while I was making a, an indie survival game, but I ended up dropping that and then working on the, the TTRPG and it's come along uh, pretty far. You could play it right now at uh, playthisrpg.com. Mm -hmm. And you did a, not a Kickstarter, but a uh, starter uh, backer kit for it. Yeah. Yeah. Backer kit. Uh, yeah. Great community. Um, they, they were very, very supportive uh, despite being smaller than, than Kickstarter, obviously it's, mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun to go through that process and learn so much. And I'm really excited to do a post-mortem mm -hmm. about everything that I learned and so many things that I shouldn't have done the way that I did them. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll get a little bit into that in our main segment today as we talk about sort of preparing and scaling your role-playing game project, whether it's a whole new game or a campaign uh, for, for the DMs out there that make their own. So I look forward to learning which you have to say about that. But first, let's get to some of our listener email. Uh, coming in this week, we have first uh, Kurt Ugel via YouTube who asked this question. Sean mentioned that sometimes developers create unnecessary rules. Parts of a system are ignored or are so situational that they get forgotten. As a game developer, is this a situation of damned if you do and damned if you don't? Uh, Raul, I'm going to step back and let you take take this to start with, uh, see what you okay. have to say. Yeah, so it, uh, there are so many rules in, let's take D&D, for example, that uh, have been developed as the multi-generational community has kind of shifted in, in what they want out of a game. And just on top of that, you you also nowadays have so many different types of players uh, and so many different ways to play uh, a role playing game. So, if you're if you're in a position like D and D, &D where you're trying to uh, appease many different types of players, it could be difficult to like hone in on exactly what rule you want players to abide by. Actually, even uh, Daggerheart recently have run into they've had to iterate and create optional rules because people play uh, the game in a certain way. So like um, seeing their initiative change from the experience that they wanted you to have uh, to that experience, but also if this works better for your table, do this other thing. Uh, and then there's some uh, ways that they, they shifted uh, how th there's like exceptions to gold handling and that sort of thing. If you want to play on a, like a per coin basis and really what it comes down to is just that it's when you have a very large, audience, it can be very difficult to deliver the exact experience that you want to deliver because you're, you're looking for, I guess, quantity um, of players, you know, bringing more, more players into the game. Whereas indie RPGs, I don't think they have as much of uh, an issue with that because they can kind of be satisfied with their very niche experience and say, if, if this isn't what you're looking for, there's so many other games out there to yeah. participate in. Yeah, it, that's very true. I think you summed it up nicely. That the damned if you do, damned if you don't thing, is is inherent in all sorts of design, 
when you do have a diverse audience. I think the best thing that you can do when you are designing is pick that sort of audience or pick that experience and then design and just make sure you avoid things that you're obviously catering to a particular play style, but you're not doing it well. So in the example of wanting a very tactical game, you can say, all right, my, our players, we're going to give them a very tactical experience as opposed to a more narrative, say, experience. And then move in that direction, but do it poorly or do it in a way that's not satisfying. And so right. that's the that's the one area where it's not it's not damned if you damned if you don't. It's I'm going to do this this way, but I've damned myself. Uh, and I see like in d and I see ability scores as that sort of they're damning themselves because they could simplify the game by removing ability scores and adding just a bonus. Uh, you know, you, you're a plus two instead of worrying about going from a 14 to a plus two. But they know that they would get rebellion from players who want to, quote, roll up a character, right? They want to roll their ability scores. So they leave that vestigial tail of a rule in the game because they want to avoid that kerfuffle of the people who uh, are being reactionary about their game. And so, yeah, it. Yeah, you know, it's the example that I key in on immediately for, for many games like this is like, we need rules for travel, even though we don't really care about that that much. Yep. And I, yeah, I feel like D&D &D falls into that trap because mm -hmm. players maybe way back did that a lot. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, not so much, but yeah, trying to satisfy that as well. Yeah. So uh, great question there. Uh, question two. Uh, from Kurt is on the Ghostfire podcast, Dale Kingsmill mentioned forgotten rules uh, with 5e, and she found her on the fly solutions were similar to the actual rules she'd forgotten about. In your opinion, what RPG games successfully apply their general core systems to most situations? And, and this is a, another good question we need to define a little bit on what a core system means because D and D does have a core system. It's roll a 20 sided die add a number, compare it to another number and see if you succeed. And in that sense, the core system manages everything except for combat where then you have to roll more dice or do these other things. One system that does use a core system very well throughout the game is fate. Because you roll your fate dice, you add numbers to it depending on your, your skills or your using of fate points to tap aspects. But in combat, it's the exact same thing as in doing a social thing. You are going for the same number. You're not rolling damage because the damage or the, uh, uh, the amount of your success is called shifts. And it's the difference between the number you ended up with and the number you're trying to exceed. So it, it uses that throughout the game. Uh, so that's one game where it sort of does it. Uh, uh, in in Fate, would you consider that a, a tactical ex experience in combat? It's a tactical narrative game. Okay. <laughs> uh, in the sense that in the narrative, you are trying to create you are trying to create the narrative that will give you the advantage. So rather than just hitting something with your sword, you can do that, but that's the worst tactic you can do. What you're trying to do is get your team in a situation where you've built up enough aspects that one person can then use all of those in order to achieve a great success. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so my experiences with the TRT, uh, TTRPGs are mostly limited to rules-heavy experiences. So that's you know three point five D and D, five E D and D, uh, Vampire and Masquerade, those sorts of things. And in at least in in my experience, the the pillar between combat and role play are split pretty heavily. And I think that comes down to 
uh, anytime that you're trying to create a very tactical uh, game from the perspective of, you know, these are where your characters are, this is how they move around the map and this sort of thing, uh, or if you're really progression focused, you tend to have to make more exceptions to the rules to create interesting choices for the, the players. Yep. And the more exceptions you have, the the more loose the game becomes and further from that that core uh, experience. So I, I guess I haven't played um, many systems that are that are like that. Uh, I was looking at City of Mist. Maybe you know uh, more about that. But it, it seems like a game that uh, works, uh, or that that takes from narrative to combat, and it's just the same style of play. Is is what it seems like from the outset? Yeah, yeah, and that that's a great point about the exceptions because that's what we see in a lot of these uh, more tactical games, especially when games that are going to be focused on combat. Like you say, it's those exceptions that that gets you in the end <laughs> uh, as you try to first create them and then balance them. Uh, and Man, writing rules is so ridiculous because uh, in a rules heavy system, because you're like, Oh, I got to account for this or because if they read it this way, then it means they could, they could do, you know, all these other things that I isn't in the spirit of, you know, what I'm intending to, to write. It's so much harder to pare down rules than it is to just make them more verbose uh that's that's the difficulty i've gone through my rules so many times in my abilities and yeah i it's, it's just so much work to try to get it right while also uh being able to be read in a natural way mm -hmm. that um that isn't all just jargon right yeah Sorry, it, I, tangents but yeah no no that, that's that's it right it's the technical writing side of things where you need to use language in a certain way to to not just get your point across, but to get the exact point across. And that's what I think you you said it. I'll reiterate it is that's why game design seems so easy at first to a lot of people, because they're like, oh, I need to cover this. You just add this. And the the addition is easy. It's the subtraction and the distillation of those rules into something that's actually usable uh, is is the the crux of, of game design and it's the hardest thing to to do by far so that was kind of a twofer uh two questions but we're going to then switch to a question from patreon supporter jason campbell uh in 5e D D, do you think as a dm that counterspell as written is a problem? And if so, how big a problem is it? If you think it's an issue, how would you change it? Here's my reasoning. Counterspell seems to interrupt the flow of the story in combat. For example, player A describes what their character does. Player B describes what their character does. Then the DM describes what the opponent does, but player A gets to say, no, that does not happen. Uh, and so that uh, that's Jason's question. Yes, you are correct, Jason. Counterspell and other mechanics like it are changing the reality and denying the narration that is taking place. Most reactions in a game like 5th edition D&D negate, they don't necessarily negate the triggering action, but sometimes they do. And they do change the reality of the narrative that you're creating. There, there's definitely a place for that in the game, uh, but those negations can be very unsatisfying to anyone who is following the story, to the DM, who sometimes just has to take it as the facilitator of the story, but definitely to the players. And I can't think of a better example than my current 5e home group this is their one trick they do. They have a grappling monk and then they have a lot of spellcasters. The spellcasters create zones that put um, damaging effects on the table and then the monk drags every all the monsters through those zones to do as much damage as possible, which is fun. It's cool. It's, it's great. So the one day I decided I'm just going to throw in three or four casters as enemies and they all have counterspell. 
And I just totally wiped the party. They had no nothing they could do about it. Uh, and they were beaten pretty severely. So it was fun once because I thought, okay, see how this might be different. But doing that every time would be awful. And so any sort of uh, reactions or denials of those things can be difficult to account for in a game and in the narrative that that game produces. Yeah, I mean, it's it makes sense that a wizard would be able to use a, a spell to you know protect themselves from from magic. But you know, when the rubber meets the road, is that fun for the players? Right. Uh, the the changes that they're making in uh, in the newest edition of or the twenty twenty four edition of Dungeons and Dragons, if if they're still if it's still using the same UA uh, as before, I know I watched the video today. Um, they did not mention counterspell mm. in, the, in the, <laughs> the video on uh, spells today, yeah. but um, but it was set up to use uh, a con save for the uh, for the person who is being counterspelled, mm. so that they can try to uh, try to you know resist that somehow, and the spell still goes through. I think that's a great option. There's some criticism when it comes to uh, you know, uh, using counterspell on a boss, and then the boss being able to use a legendary resistance to just, you know, shrug it off. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but there is, there's some cool stuff too. You can see that they're trying to protect the players from this feel bad experience because even in the verbiage, like you don't lose your, uh, your spell slot. If you're, if you get mm -hmm. counterspelled, you just lose the, the time you spent trying to do it, mm -hmm. uh, or the, the action or whatever. So mechanically you can make it work. And I think this is counterspell is kind of one of those, uh, vestiges of older editions that are, uh, being passed down and you, you might just kind of have to deal with it but from a gm from from your where you're sitting you can structure the, the encounter any way that you you want so and you can also ban spells that you don't necessarily that you don't think will be conducive to the story True. so you have control just remember that um it's it's not a video game but uh at the same time i, I totally understand where you're, you're coming from and i hope that the 2024 version of Counterspell is more conducive to the style of gameplay that we would like to see, uh, you know, rules as written. Mm -hmm. I I rarely played spellcasters throughout the editions, at least mages, but I remember, or I let me say, I don't remember as a player of AD and D ever being able to not. Uh, get hit in the face with the fireball from the bad guys. I don't remember any wizards ever counterspelling. So if, if counterspell was added, uh, I would say it was in third edition or beyond. I don't remember it being in the earlier editions, but uh, okay. someone will correct me and all of my old school cred uh, will be denied and my license will be revoked. And it'll be a sad day. It, it will be a sad day. Well, I probably should have my license taken away from me anyway at this point. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, last question via Patreon from Dave Canella, who says, I have a slightly provocative question for you. And that's how we like our questions here, Dave. Is it time for 5e to stop pretending and just ditch resource management? With the upcoming version, the design team seems really worried players could run out of limited resources like spell slots, wild shape uses, rages, etc., and keep adding ways to make sure that doesn't happen. Combined with the core assumption at the root of the resource management cycle, such as six to eight encounters in an adventuring day, that seems so out of touch with how most people play, we're left with the tedium of resource tracking without the excitement or narrative impact of resource scarcity. Barbarians must be able to rage every combat and now outside of it too. Uh, my short answer to that is yes. <laughs> the game over the years was quite well served by resource management aspects, but it is a different audience now. And if it's not their preferred way to play, then the game is going to move in that direction. Uh, so I agree that I think with 4E, we saw a resistance to a way of gamifying resource management through the use of daily powers and encounter powers. And and uh, I forgot what the ones that you could cast all the time were uh, at will powers. Uh, 
and distilling it down to that was a great game, but it sort of rubbed people the wrong way who were used to the illusion that resource management wasn't a part of the game. And so it's just, it's going to be there, I think, just like ability scores, regardless of what the game might want us to, the the best way to evolve the game might be that way, but it's not going to happen. Yeah. Do you think that uh, people's reluctance surrounding the way that that game or that fourth edition was designed, do you think it was just before its time? I, I think it was exactly at the right time. I think the audience was behind the times. Okay. Yeah. But right. I think that's the same way of saying yes, right. it was ahead of its time. Okay. Uh, so I, with, with a slightly provocative question, um, I, I want to approach it a little bit differently because I think that the point of, uh, of D&D in 2024 is less, or is, I think it's trying to detach itself, uh, itself from that core assumption that, okay, you need to, you know, adventure this many times or, uh, you know, have this many encounters throughout the day. I think we are focusing now on just having a fun one shot encounter and the difference between 2020 or 2014 and 2024 is that in 2014, the classes were balanced around that attrition. So you, you see things like, um, uh, or so that doesn't really jive with the, with the way that we actually play. Right. So when you have a wizard that has just a bucket of you know spells, they don't really have to do anything other than use their best spell right at the start of combat because they're not saving it for anything because they know that there's going to be a long rest. So look at, uh, in 2024 or rather I should say, sorry, there's just the year editions. Um, so in 2014, um, so because like something uh, like the wizard knows that it's going to get that long rest, it kind of overshadows something like the, the warlock, which is intended to, you know, pick up spell slots during short rests and be able to be a little bit more flexible. Realistically, because of the way that we played, Warlock felt kind of stifling or uh, stifled in its uh, abilities. So I think as we move to 2024, we're focusing uh, more on that really fun one-shot experience. And then the DM, instead of having to rely on attrition, now gets to choose when they want to apply that attrition to players. So if you really want to make them feel the hurt, they're, they're designed to have a, a really good uh, encounter uh, or one shot encounter, but then you can start to, uh, you know, drag them into to multiple encounters and the, the gameplay is going to feel different, but hopefully all the base classes are on the same starting field mm -hmm. uh, by virtue of how they're designing in 2024. And when it comes to uh, resources, I, I don't think, I, I really don't see it as tedium because we are already comfortable with the way that managing those resources uh, currently works uh, from 2014. I think we're more giving uh, players the the feel good moments of pressing buttons on their character. So like, yes, I press the rage and yeah, you're probably not going to run out of rages maybe, but you could, if things go, you know, the wrong direction, you know, I, I get to press the button on, on wild shape. And I think that feels more fun maybe than just being able to, than just removing resource management altogether. I think that even if it is an illusion of scarcity of resources, there's still an inherent uh, feeling that comes from uh, just from the, the knowledge that your resources are limited. Mm -hmm. Every choice might not matter, but, but it could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that is a, a, a excellent point. I will just end by saying, I think a lot of this also goes from the D and D initially being a surrogate for novels, pulling its research, pulling its uh, words are escaping me today. Pull it, pulling its uh, theme, pulling its genre from Lord of the Rings and and those those things where you know it was longer. We were used to things getting beat down. Um, it was always about, oh, he's on his last breath. He's, And I think more recently, we see people coming to D&D &D from movies, from, from television, 
from short episodic things that don't really rely on that as much. Yes, we may see the hero get beat severely before they win in the end, but there's not that sort of they don't have any other tricks to pull out. And this is the last gasp. And that was sort of what the game in its resource management heyday was meant to show. You need to come up with a way to get around this or get through this problem with only one spell left or with no healing left or what have you. And that was kind of, that was the fun part. Mm -hmm. I, I think more so back then. Yeah. Now it's blowing people up because you're the Power Rangers. Yep. And you know you might get beat down, but uh, ultimately things are going to be fine, most likely. Yep. Most likely. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you for all those questions. And at the end of the show, I will tell you how you can come and talk to us uh, here on Mastering Dungeons. But let's get into our news and commentary section now, where we're going to start with an ad week interview with the new D&D VP, Jess Lanzillo. So Jess Lanzillo was named VP of Franchise and Product for D&D. This is a completely new title, as far as we know. She had a similar role on the Magic the Gathering side of Wizards, uh, where she, despite some challenges in the market and challenges with the Wizards hierarchy itself, managed to sort of turn the Magic the Gathering team and get them all moving in the right direction. So now it looks like they're tapping her to do the same thing on the D&D side. And it will be interesting to see after release of the 2024 rules what happens, not just with the game, but with the franchise itself uh, under Jess's leadership. And why this is interesting to me is there is almost infinitely more bits of money to be made licensing out D&D for video games, for, for entertainment uh, purposes than there is in the actual published game, which sort of has a limited ceiling in terms of revenue generation. And so I'm always keen on who is in charge and what directives are they going to be looking at in terms of the game, yes, but also all those other things. And so uh, Jess's interview was asked the typical questions of, hey, what's D&D? Hey, what's Stranger Things? And how was the Stranger Things tied to D&D, right? Those sort of tangential questions. Uh, so there's nothing super revealing, but uh, you can go read the Ad Week interview. There's a link in the show notes. And uh, you can share on our forums, or on our Discord, uh, what you think of that. Did you get a chance to, to look at that interview? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. Um, how, how long ago did uh, did this changeover occur? It looks like it was in the, within the last couple of months. I didn't see an exact date uh, on on the interview itself, but it's. I know that there has been turnover at Wizards. There was the large layoffs way back when, and there have also been other promotions. Uh, not firings, but you know, layoffs, et cetera, et cetera, recently. Uh, so there's always a shuffling going on there, it seems. And this was the one that sort of stuck out and and she was elevated to this new position. Yeah, it's funny that you mention uh, just how much money is uh, made elsewhere, you know, outside yeah. of the, the TTRPG space. And when you look at D&D as an IP, mm -hmm. I think they're maybe controversial. I, I think they're doing it correctly mm -hmm. because if you're acting as the, as the largest part of the funnel for the entirety of the TTRP hobby, the way that you bring people into the hobby as a whole, which benefits everybody mm -hmm. is that you uh, put your, your tendrils in other places to, you know, spread awareness. And yeah, I, it's funny. I, I just, the, the thing that I'm always very, um, hesitant about when I see, you know, cross promotion with other brands, um, or other, other products is, is just how much of it is going to affect the TTRPG space. Mm -hmm. And I think if they're being smart, 
like I, I don't think they're going to hammer us with like, you know, Lego content alongside all of our PHP material and that sort of like it, that wouldn't make sense. They've done a really good job at kind of like segmenting those different, uh, or compartmentalizing those areas uh, of the brand to where I think we're probably seeing the best version of it from the marketing side. Cause if they just like, if the marketing efforts were to just narrow down, kind of collapse and focus solely on Dungeons and Dragons, it really wouldn't go anywhere. Yeah. So I, I'd love to see, oh, especially recently, just um, how much interaction they seem to be having with the content creators. And actually we're probably going to talk about that later, aren't we? Yep. Okay. Um, but uh, they, I, I wonder if this is a, a new direction moving forward or if it's just one of those, you know, once a 10 year uh, or once every 10 year efforts right. that are kind of um, put out because it's this massive, massive push and focus on, on marketing and just the, the interaction between the community. It, it's, it takes a lot of effort in time in energy planning scheduling to to make this stuff work so this is usually planned years in advance or like at least a year in advance is because it's it's it doesn't just fall out of you know out of thin air yeah. i don't know where i'm going with this but the, those are the the thoughts that are kind of stewing yeah it's it's a question of resources versus um benefits and I've had talks with people in the industry who have told me that it has to happen at some point that wizards will keep D and D as a brand, but they will outsource the creation of the game because the game itself isn't profitable enough in a shareholder driven ecosystem to justify the expense of creating this thing that doesn't really sell to the extent that a uh, shareholder-driven, stock-driven uh, paradigm to, to justify it. And part of me is like, no, that could never happen. And then I see all sorts of strange things happen at companies and go, eh, maybe it could, who knows? Yeah, I wonder if we should, I, I wonder if we should even worry about that though, because, you know, we don't want to be anxious about the future mm -hmm. and, and, and feel that pain now just for, for what could be, but we should do exactly what, well, I mean, most of what happened in, in 2023 with like the OGL, like your response to that mm -hmm. has obviously made people rethink some of the decisions that they were going to make. Right. So I think that sort of, um, violent, uh, protection mm -hmm. of, the, the community kind of conveys the importance that we all have as individuals and even just like the kind of the, the stabbing that's going on with, uh, with AI, um, and trying to get rid of, of that, out, you know, get it out of wizards. Like it's, it's not what it's, what, you know, magic has ever been about, you know, get it out of uh, D and D, you know, it's, it's hurting artists. I think those continued conversations when done with, uh, intensity, mm -hmm. hopefully also with respect. Um, will lend itself to uh, to keeping more people, you know, on the design team mm -hmm. instead of you know, you know, sending it out overseas because you can see that there is some value even if you're like the lowest earner of the company. It is still the core identity of Dungeons and Dragons. It may not be, you know, ten years from now, mm -hmm. but chances are, uh, continuing to perpetuate uh, this the sort of like beating heart mm -hmm. is is only going to benefit uh, the IP in the long run as they, you know, again, to continue to like reach out and put their tendrils and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. It'll, we will be keeping an eye on the show about what sort of partnerships and marketing strategies that they, they use. And in the meantime, the D and D players handbook and dungeon masters guide for 2024 are being previewed all over the internet. Uh, not only is Wizards of the Coast previewing a lot of the player's handbook content on D&D Beyond, they're also sharing out information that is being picked up by 
many of the influencers out there in uh, YouTube land, Twitch land, and so on. Most of the things I've seen have been player's handbook previews, but Dale Kingsmill over at Monarch's Factory is doing a Silver Dragon Inn series that's looking at the Dungeon Master's Guide content for 2024 as well. Uh, I have all of these things in the show notes talking about Rangers and Warlocks, but we're running a little bit long in this segment, so I'm just going to say... Check it out. Uh, we've already previewed a little bit of how the Warlock is changing. It seems like they're going to get a few more spell slots uh, or refresh those spell slots a little uh, more. So uh, we'll discuss when we get the final version uh, of all the rules. We will definitely be looking at it. One thing about these previews is they're, they're marketing. Right. They're they're giving information, but they're giving it in a certain way. And there were many times when I read the little marketing bits about a certain power or a certain ability. And I'm like, wait, that doesn't make any sense because we don't have the exact final technical writing uh, bits of rules yet. So uh, there are many questions still to be answered by some of these, even some of these previews. Has I love been... what they're doing. Uh, yeah, I, I love they're talking to the content creators about this because it only helps uh, strengthen the, the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's the the initial act of like uh, wizards reaching out or D and D to reaching out, uh, to say, "Hey, this is uh, a, a section of the book. Can you cover it? This is how much we'll pay you uh, for for doing that." And then there's the trickle effect of them making the video, them being excited, uh, and then there's also, you know, we we were invested in our content creators, mm -hmm. so there's a, a level of trust there that goes into it. And, and then there's the trickle down of people, you know, making videos about what they hear from other people's videos, which just yeah. kind of just leaks out, you know, permeates everything. And that's how you generate hype. Mm -hmm. That's how you make people excited. Or, uh, that's how you make people, you know, even if, even with contention, like talking about the game, you know, you can, you don't have to agree with everything, but the more that you talk about it, the more that this launch is going to be successful, it's going to be top of mind. And, uh, again, Wizards is doing this in a very intelligent fashion right now. And I'm really excited to see them actually be able to acknowledge more content creators within the space and not necessarily just the largest ones. Mm -hmm. It's, it's all cool stuff. Yeah. Yep. I have been perusing the various sites to see what people are saying and leaking and, and talking about. And it's, it is, it, it ramps up the community. It brings D and D, a few levels higher uh, each time somebody talks about it and spreads that information and spreads that entertainment. I want to talk for just a second about something that intersects all parts of my life. Uh, on D&D Beyond, the Grim Hollow Player Pack has been released. For those of you who don't know, I work uh, as a contractor for Ghostfire Gaming. And we have now put content on Grim Hollow or on D and D Beyond from our Grim Hollow books for players. We've had some layers up there, some monsters up there, but this uh, content is for the the players. If you are already a Grim Hollow fan, you probably know all of this already. Uh, if you haven't been a Grim Hollow uh, follower, if you have not bought any of the books, if you have not used any of the content, this is your chance to get just a taste of it. So on D&D Beyond, for I think it was $14.99 or $15.99, you get two new classes, uh, the Wexelkind and the Disembodied, six new subclasses, the Path of the Carry Carrion Raven Barbarian, the College of Requiem Bard, the Inquisition Domain Cleric, the Blade Berserker Fighter, the Oath of Zeal Paladin, and the Misfortune Bringer Rogue. Uh, what's cool is two of these are actually not from our player's guide, but they're from a more recent product, our Valakin Clans book. And what we did with that book is each of the classes got a subclass uh, that used, and I, the name popped out of my head, it uses a system which essentially, did I write it down? Of course I didn't. Uh, it, it is a, it's a system where you get to 
do martial maneuvers. Thank you, Sean. Martial maneuver system. So what this does is it gives each of the subclasses a number of points, and using those points, you can do certain maneuvers. So it's almost like a weapon mastery, but on a larger scale. You can make your fighters feel more wizardy or more tactically magical. Uh, so the Path of the Carrion Raven Barbarian and the Blade Berserker Fighter use those martial maneuvers. And I'm super excited that those two got pulled into D&D Beyond and that system then was introduced into D&D Beyond and we may see more of that uh, in the future. You can also get 10 new spells in the player pack and 12 new magic items. We have a link in the show notes to the D&D Beyond site where that can be purchased and then a YouTube video where all of that is discussed. Uh, what's your favorite part of either something that you've worked on from Hollow or uh, or just what's made it to D&D Beyond? Uh, I, I think what I just mentioned is probably my favorite thing, although the, the Vexelkin as a as a species as a race or i'm sorry as a as a it's not two new classes it's two new uh species the wexelkind and this embodied the, the wexelkind are puppets that fey use to replace real humans and there's a glamour on them so that the the parents of these children who are replaced don't realize it, except the the glamour fades over time. And soon the parents realize that their actual child was replaced by this replica. But the replica is still a sentient creature, although it's made of wood. And the whole story about, well, what do you do then? What do you do with these creatures? And how do they integrate into a, a world that both fears them and reviles them, but they are still present and not uh, culpable in what was done, you know, to the the humans that they replace. So it's sort of I love that that uh, that conceit and how it plays out in a, in a story that you can tell. That's wicked depressing. Yeah, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Just, yeah, having to have your I mean, if you're a if you're a parent, mm -hmm. it's wicked. It's yeah. uh, not just depressing terrifying terrifying yeah uh yeah uh the i, I remember i think um ben Byrne mentioned that you know given that they are uh constructs they they're more f like they can wander through you know plague cities right and and help the the people who are there which is super I, I love the flavor that surrounds that terrifying though yeah it's it is when, when i first read that i was like that's cool that's horrifying but that's cool and speaking of horrifying but cool, the next little bit of advice or the next bit of news also has to do with Grim Hollow because what we're doing is we are, for our next Kickstarter starting in October of 2024, we are refreshing the entire Grim Hollow setting and all of the rules that go along with it. With the release of the 2024 core rules, we decided that now is the time to step into this void and do this, uh, do this all, do a refresh of all of our player rules, add a new class called the Monster Hunter, which has been in playtest. You could play test it right now. We're going to implement a heritage system where rather than picking a species and getting a set of abilities based on that, you will be able to choose different aspects to build your own custom species or build the flavor around the species that you have already chosen. So your human could be have dwarf-like traits or however you want to uh, narratively decide that it works, you will have this system. If you're familiar with the Aurora setting, with the Valakan Clans book, or with our new Ethereal Expanse book, we use a heritage system in those as well. Uh, we will update all of our transformations from lycanthropes to liches to vampires to uh, seraphs to elementals, to everything. Uh, we'll get that. We will revise all of our current subclasses as necessary to fit the new rules and then create at least 12 new subclasses. Uh, all of our lore is going to get a refresh uh, in terms of expansion 
and clarification based on our feedback from people who have been following the ghost fire stuff since 2019. Uh, the Kickstarter is not going to be up until October, but you can go and sign up to be notified when the Kickstarter starts and also get all of the playtest stuff that we're releasing. The Monster Hunter is already out. The Heritage System is about to go out and the transformations will also be playtested uh, later this year. Thank you for hanging in there uh, while I while I read that off. No, that, that's it's, it's a lot for sure. Uh, October yeah. is a great time for uh, to launch that Kickstarter. Then. Oh, yes. The Grim Hollow spookiness. October is perfect. Uh, and just one thing I want to mention in our creator corner this week. It's a book called How Not to Get Eaten by an Owl Bear. It is published through uh, Penguin Random House. And this is the blurb for it. An in-world guide written from the point of view of a newly invented character from D&D's lore. This book will answer your burning questions via chapters about deadly fauna, magical mishaps, urban perils, merciless monsters, and much more. Whether you want to know which is the best tavern in Baldur's Gate or have a pressing need for tips on how to escape an ogre's lair, with this handy, humorous guide, your adventures will end in fame and fortune rather than in someone else's stomach. So this is just uh, one of those, you know, it's for the children and for grownups to get a little taste of D&D in a, in a new and different way. Uh, we have a link in the show notes, but the book again is How Not to Get Eaten by an Owl Bear by Ann Toole, and you can find it at Random House, penguinrandomhouse.com. <laughs> 